My guest today is Dr. Anna Bunio, who is Senior Research Associate at the University of Sydney. Her research interests include environmental impact of human development. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so, so thanks for doing this. I want to start with your 2019 paper, Urban Impacts Across Realms, Making the Case for Inter-Realm Monitoring and Management. You say burgeoning populations and the increasing concentration of humans in urban areas have resulted in extensive and increasing degradation and destruction of natural ecosystems. The multitude of impacts and their drivers in urban areas are often studied at local scales, you say, but there is regularly a mismatch between the spatial extent of the impacts and that of the pressures driving those impacts. Yeah, so, so we see this in the United States too. Um, you know, people get excited about solving sort of localized, identifiable, tangible problems um, with uh, with perhaps short-term solution solutions. But um, you're talking about here is is more of a, a systemic impact on the on the environment, right? And we have to deal with that differently from you know just sort of band-aiding things. That at least that's the way that I understand it. Yes, um, I think we we usually tend to think, okay, we have an area that, for example, we we have a bit of deforestation, right? Uh, maybe to do a bit of a development, develop a small town, expand a town or a city. Um, we tend to think of, okay, how many species did we lost, and how many, you know, by that deforestation, and how many plants did we lost, and you know, the capacity of maybe um, fix CO2 and all that kind of thing. But then there is more like that. There is more there are wider impacts in a space and scale. Because what happens is when you do that deforestation and you start building roads and you start building houses, uh, you start you you basically stole the stormwater system and sewage. And what happens there is when it rains, all the water that used to be infiltrated down the soil, feeding the, the plants and the animals, and also going down and potentially feeding um, the groundwater, uh, or maybe even the rivers around it, all that gets um, funneled and channeled into the stormwater systems, collecting a lot of you know, um, contaminants in the way either litter or, you know, the things that we see in the streets, but also a lot of smaller contaminants and things like fertilizers in the gardens, for example, and um, little bits of uh, rubber from the tires and stuff like that. And that all gets then channeled out into some close water body, uh, the closest that, 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 the, that the city or the town has. And usually that stormwater system is not um, that the water is not really treated as sewage is, um, and so we don't only have the impact of removing that that vegetation, the biodiversity at the moment of development, but we have long term impacts of that development in the wider ecosystem and at a larger scale than is usually considered. Um, water connects everything, so um, yeah. if water flows, there will be some contaminants going with it. Yeah, and it's sort of um, uh, there are a lot of uh, interrelationships there, right? It's clearly a non-linear system. As I men mentioned, I, I, I used to be a civil engineer. Uh, my dad is a professor of civil engineering, civil structural engineering, and um, he has done a lot of construction. I haven't, uh, and I have a lot of friends uh, from engineering schools, um, you know, who talk about modern construction methods, um, modern ways to, you know, really put up very tall buildings and so on. Uh, but what you're talking about here is um, sort of the, the toxicity um, permeates the environment, right? It, it kind of feeds uh, in itself. And over time, you have a problem that that is really not solvable unless we sort of intervene systematically across a large, large part of the system. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think I think I think the solutions here they have to be they have to be 
have to be small solutions. Everybody in their houses can set up um, rain gardens and you know we harvest storm water nowadays and things like that and all that helps a lot and I think the accumulation and that is a very interesting question we really have no idea there's, there's for sure there's models but no actual empirical data of how the accumulation of those little interventions that every ho homeowner can do how they add up to, mm -hmm. a, to a change to a big change we really have very little idea of, of what what that looks like. Is it possible though? Is it possible? So suppose, you know, once you identify a problem, and as you argue here, it, it is sort of a, a, a large problem that affects a large area, a lot of things sort of interrelated. Is it possible to tackle that uh, house, house by house and person by person? Uh, or do we need a more systemic intervention? Uh, we need it all. <laughs> Of course we do. We need, I, I think that, um, you know, governments need to take their, their role in this, uh, processing and cleaning stormwater as much as, as they do in sewage. Um, that can be, you know, a policy uh, change around the topic. And plus, um, if everybody in their household, I mean, government cannot tell you what to do on your little piece of land. So it's about all of us individually as well adding to that. So if we reduce the volume of that stormwater, because there's two things happening here. We have increased, we have the contaminants coming down, but we do have a greatest volume of the fresh water coming into our coastal systems because a lot of that water used to be infiltrated down um, into the soil and now it's washed out directly. So households have a big role to play in also reducing the volume of stem water that they basically uh, put back into the system. Um, so I think it should be, a, a, you know, my, my idea, my utopia is that it's a, it's a you know, everybody keeps in. And that is only considered <laughs> one aspect of this. Yeah, so you talk about in the paper, uh, sort of intrinsic impacts, you say, sort of terrestrial habitats, uh, but also aquatic worms, uh, extrinsic impacts. Um, so could you talk a bit about that? Uh, how how you differentiate between those? Yes, I think I think that the idea of this is um, there are most of our activities occur on land, and as as and and a lot of those activities produce waste and have some kind of impact in. In, in the ecosystem surrounding them. And just storm water is one example of those. Um, but there is also a certain, of, um, certain amount of activities that occur in the sea. Yeah, we, we're talking about shipping and recreational and fishing potentially as well. Um, we're talking about coastal development um, and the actual modification and construction of seawalls and breakwaters and that kind of thing. So those activities that are in the system, in the marine system, and as a marine ecologist, as my focus, those is what I call intrinsic activities that have an impact on the system where the activity occurs. Um, I guess the point of that paper was to try to say, but activities that do not necessarily occur in the sea also have impacts in the sea. And those are the, what I'm calling extrinsic. Um, because often, often we forget that the impacts, there's a mismatch, that impacts um, have a wider spatial, um, activities have a wider spatial, the impacts of activities are wider in spatial scale than activity itself. Yeah, and, and water is at the center of this in some sense, right? So. Um, all the toxicity that we talk about, and increasingly in the modern world, we have a lot of toxicity on pharmaceutical products. There, there, there are a lot of stuff going into the water from that perspective. So um, at the end of the day, I, I, guess, I guess the question is, I mean, we can almost go into this uh, problem assuming that there is a problem <laughs> that needs to be solved because it's everywhere, right? So. So can we devise some sort of, um, I don't want to call it packaged, but some set of heuristics we can go in with from an intervention perspective? You know, can we sort of optimize the limit of resources that countries have to take care of this problem in some way? Yeah, I think, 
I, I really don't think that this is a problem. I think there's a series of problems and layers to this, and it will require different type of actions to address the different issues um, that, um, for example, cities and urbanizations have um, and how they impact the environment. I, so far, I've been talking about contamination and, and water and stormwater, but there's also things like the idea of heat pollution that I think is now very, um, but people are having to, to understand a bit more that if you add greenery to cities, it's kind of um, dumps a bit that idea of heat pollution. We have no idea how that heat pollution in the city affects aquatic mm. environments. We have very little information about that. Uh, there is noise pollution, there's light pollution as well. And, and I think all of those different types of impacts require a different type of intervention. Um, and so I guess that's the complexity and the, and the and of, of this issue. Um, it's not one, it's several. Um, and it's about what I'm trying to propose and always trying to, we need to find a compromise. I live in a city, I grow up in the city, I still live in a city. So um, how can we find a compromise to, you know, still have a good quality of life and live in cities and highly urbanized areas, a lot of us do, but at the same time, trying to protect the environment around us. Um, we are designing and, and tackling if you want impact by impact from a scientific perspective, we are trying to find solutions to all of these independent uh, problems. Um, and uh, ecology is weird now, there's, there's a big term that we call now nature-based solutions, which are those where we use living organisms uh, to try to solve, reintroduce them or, or put them in areas maybe where where we, we have that we have developed and urbanized to try to kind of counteract or mitigate some of these impacts. And it's a, there's a variety of tools that, that we are testing, have been testing for a good amount of decades and now and continue testing now. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly a multifactorial pollution problem. Um, you know, I tend to think about this more from an economic perspective. So there are limited resources, there are some uncertain outcomes in the future. So interventions have, you know, in some sense, some economic value that we can assign to them. Um, there is an optimization problem there, I think. You know, what's the best, uh, what's the best way uh, from an economic perspective to tackle it? Um, as you say, we don't really know. I mean, so, so in the city, you mentioned light pollution, um, noise, sound pollution, in addition to chemical pollution. Um, we've been collecting a lot of data, I would imagine, right? So um, it, it's, uh, it's a world of big data now. <laughs> and so, so we probably have more information now, I would think, to tackle this problem better. Is that true or not? Um, yes, what's interesting here is that we understand, I think, the magnitude of the activity. We understand how much we change the light environment. We understand how much we've modified um, land and we're starting to understand the extent of how much we modify the seas in terms of construction and replacing natural habitats by human-made structures. Um, what is not that clear anymore, even though there are studies that clearly point towards towards ecological impacts. We still don't have a full picture of the variety and full extent of ecological impacts that those activities have. Um, so we understand that having light pollution, for example, and having having uh, lighting the shoreline at night, that basically what it does is it allows predators to and that think about the fish to see and predate at night at a time where other animals, their prey used to be mm. active and foraging around because they were safe from predators. We're now putting lights there and mm. making their life more difficult. So we understand that for a, for a, for a certain amount of a species and certain, certain coasts of the world, but we don't fully understand the effect of that to a food chain, for example, or we don't understand how that translates to other systems. We don't understand 
for example, if it's um, if there is a linear or some kind of relationship, the more light we add, uh, the more we increase this response. Or is it that there is a plateau at some point? Um, so we we understand these things definitely impact when whenever we studied systems we found impacts we just don't understand the extent um and as and the idea here of the mismatch is very clear the studies that have tried to put a dollar value to and this is very typical of um habitat restoration strategies you know trying to put up back so marshes and silver seas and oyster reefs they have calculated values of how much uh, those the ecosystem services, we call them, those systems provide to humans. And we try to give that a dollar value. Those are huge underestimations because those are dollar values that are only assessing how the habitat in self and some components in some instances are what the services are providing. But those habitats that we put there, if we restore an oyster reef, it's affecting the surrounding environment as well. And we have little understanding how the restoration of an oyster reef affects surrounding environments. And there would be for sure no effects um, that would add to that value. So I think my point here is when you add the ecological complexity and the variability, and then I feel like we know very little at this point. Yeah, it's also a sequential uh, decision problem in the sense that um, you, you have to keep at it for a period of time for that to work. Uh, and, and when there's an environmental change, there, there are winners and losers. So what is going to lose is sort of biodiversity, right? So it is, if you change the environment, some species are going to dominate that. I mean, we have seen that in, in a lot of different places. And when some species start to dominate, uh, it may be a very unstable system because there isn't enough diversity in the system, right? So that is that's one of the issues that I think we are dealing with here. Yes, absolutely. So I guess that the uh, that is a very good point. I guess you go to the core of uh, why do we care so much about biodiversity and why should we care about how many species are there? And um, And I think at the core of that is this idea of functional redundancy. So if you have a lot of species, um, each species plays a role in the ecosystem. You know, plants um, are primary producers. They use light uh, to photosynthesize and produce energy. Uh, they're the base of, of, the, of the food chain. Um, and the more diversity of plants you have and the more, the more, you know, and that's one function. There's a lot of different functions in the system. So the more species you have performing that function, something happens if there's some, you know, a huge storm, a tsunami, uh, an earthquake. If whatever happens, we lose one of those. There is redundancy in the system. There's other species that can occupy, step up, and and cover for the for the function lost for, for that for the, for that species. But if you have a system that has only a few species, you don't have that functional diversity. You lose one of those. And the system goes to collapse. Um, and there are a lot of ex examples in nature of how can that happen. So yeah, I think that that's a very interesting point. Yes, yeah, so I want to go into another paper that you have more recently, uh, current and projected global extent of marine built structures. You say the sprawl of marine construction is one of the most extreme human modifications to global seascapes. Uh, nevertheless, its global extent remains largely unquantified compared to that on land. We synthesize disparate information from a diversity of sources to provide a global assessment of the extent of existing and projected marine construction and its effects on the lands or on the seascape. Uh, I'm very interested in this, uh, Anna. The, so I grew up in South India, very close to very close to the the coast. And uh, I live in the US now, very close to the water as well. And um, I think you have some sort of country, country wide metrics in this paper, if I remember correctly. Um, because these developments have been sort of um, non uniform, right? Different countries have been more aggressive and less aggressive with uh, marine built structures. Is that true? 
Yes, um, yes. So there are things I think playing here. One is uh, surely countries have, I would say that whenever there's a high density of population, you get a lot more um, coastal development. Now, what that looks like is more related to the country, to the, um, you know, the, if whether the developing country or not, or whether, or even whether the country that has um, huge cities or a country that is that where the coastline is less populated. Um, so you do get a variety of different modifications that we have down the coastline. So um, you have areas like Europe uh, and the Mediterranean where they have modified and added breakwaters and sea and, and sea walls. And they basically have lined the shoreline with all these uh, human built structures. By doing that, they replace, they got rid of things like salt marsh and um, mangrove mangrove um, forests and they have also um, got, got really potentially of uh, things like sandy beaches and things like that or even maybe they were not that sandy they were a bit more shelly so they were not nice for people so why don't, don't we put a seawall there <laughs> we reclaim that line so some countries have gone um, you know have more potentially need for a space. So land reclamation has been a big, a, a big impact in the marine environment. And that is when we basically use low lane areas are usually soil marsh that are really at the fringe between terrestrial and marine and fill it up, lift it out a bit so that we can construct over it. But some areas like for example, <clears throat> um, in China, um, whether they they have done things like this, but in China and generally in Asia, most of the soil marshes and mangroves have been modified into aquaculture farms, and um, it's a different type of development. But they have been very severely um, changed. And mangroves are big trees; they had to get rid of to to build a lot of prawn um, prawn ponds, um, and. A lot of these areas are very important in 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 the coastal marine ecosystems. Coastal marine coastal marine ecosystems are the most productive and the most diverse in the marine world. So they basically that's where most of the primary productivity occurs, and that the is the area that basically feeds a lot of the of the activity that is happening deeper and into the oceans. So the the, the modifying and losing a lot of these habitats, and also in a lot of cases is losing the area, not just losing the habitat itself, like the mangrove converting it into, but we also lost area because we converted sea area or, or marine area into land. And all of that is has effects at, at the global scale that I don't think we started to grasp, but we understand the loss in biodiversity directly because of the replacement. But how that is affecting the bigger biodiversity, that, that you know, the bigger uh, functioning of the seas, that is a lot less understood. Yeah. Environment like the climate uh, is really difficult to predict in the long term. <laughs> And so uh, any short term interventions without a real sort of systematic thinking, at least uh, for the long term, uh, is going to be suboptimum. And, you know, I, I was wondering, Anna, so, you know, we have global warming, um, sea levels are apparently rising, um, and there will be more interventions um, on, on the, on the, uh, the, around the sea to, to land a boundary. And I think that's only going to increase, right? So I don't know much about this. So um, uh, in India, for, for instance, I don't see a lot of development. Maybe uh, I haven't been back for <laughs> many, many years, so I don't really know. Uh, in the US, we are very aggressive, you know, about really, you know, putting walls and, you know, really sort of uh, keeping the sea away from us. And I wonder what the situation is in South America, I mean, because you probably know a bit about it in Argentina, um, very, very long uh, coastlines. So what, what's happening in, in, um, in South America? 
So I guess the, the biggest activity is probably around Brazil. Um, in Brazil, they are a country that um, grow, the, the culture is around the sea and their biggest cities is around the sea. And um, most of the population is really laying around the sea. And um, there are different things happening in Brazil. There's some, so there's some areas where um, some cities are more touristic, but there's huge amount of development stems of marinas, for example. Um, I have to do, do a lot more with recreational activities, whereas there's other cities that are more um, are more uh, or, urban in the typical sense, business oriented, if you want industrialized, and those are uh, probably there. There's more kind of the sea wall uh, approach to things and breakwaters and things like that, where you you you're basically protecting. Yeah, it's for for coastal protection. Um, a lot of a lot of South America is, and especially Argentina, where I come from, the biggest coastal cities are really on, on the river. They're not on the sea. Uh, and our coast is actually very low populated. So we do have, we do have entrances of, of ports that have huge breakwaters and things like that. But um, the big modifications haven't happened uh, yet, not to the extent that it has happened to other places. So I guess it really is it's a country by country scenario there. And we are in collaboration with uh, researchers from uh, from Sao Paulo uh, at the moment. They're trying to understand the extent of that uh, modification in Brazil, because one of the challenges we found when writing this article was that um, most of the information that was available was of those of developing countries. Mm -hmm. So it was very hard to find information um, on, on, on marine infrastructure um, for developing countries. So it's a big, um, it is a big effort that they're put, going through to map and try to understand how much of the of their shore has been modified. That's happening right now. So I might tell yeah. you about it in a year or so. <laughs> uh, I mean, the scary part is two things are interacting here. One is the global warming. And generally, you know, you're trying to intervene to, to protect the seashore, uh, so to speak. But in doing so, you are also affecting the environment quite drastically. Um, and, the, you know, sort of the ecosystem in the sea quite drastically. And we haven't really analyzed how these two effects are going to interrelate with each other. Uh, you know, uh, higher and higher walls are going to go up um, at the sea. And uh, I'm not sure if, if, you know, people have really thought through what the, what the impact of that is going to be on the environment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from, from our perspective, uh, that's why we are pushing with these um, nature-based solution ideas. We think, and there's a lot of research at the moment happening around the idea that Instead of putting out a bigger wall, we need to restore the lost coastal habitats that have very important functions to protect us from storm surges, etc. So restoring salt marsh, restoring mangroves, restoring oyster reefs, instead of putting bigger walls. Um, now, that doesn't solve the problem that low area, er, lane areas will still be lower than sea level if sea level rises. Um, and we, I guess, utopic scientists, ecologists, we, uh, I, and I am definitely one, I'm an advocate for, for, um, for realignment, for, you know, if it's low-lying areas, we need to move back. Um, and it's a very hard conversation to have with homeowners, of course, right, especially if they have been living there for generations. Uh, so it's a very complicated topic. Um, and, but we don't see how any wall or any human built structure will be stronger than nature. I guess it's maybe, <laughs> it's maybe a pessimistic, um, my pessimistic view of the situation right now. But in terms of, in terms of a lot of the, um, apart from sea level rise, in, ter in terms of the, of the other changes in climate um, that coming in, changes that are happening with climate change, 
Um, restoring natural habitats is a big part to try to um, combat that. We cannot stop it at this point. It's already happened. A lot of that already happened and it's, 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 it has happening. And we, I don't think, have tools to act fast enough to revert that. But if we start early, um, we can at least make minimize the impacts um, as much as we can. And potentially, at some point, uh, we'll get to a point if we act in a, a scale enough that we can reverse them. But it, we won't do that if we're still sitting and waiting for ideas to come in. Yeah, and I've been sort of fascinated by the cultural variation around this. So in the US, we would love to be right by the water, you know, so we, we want to build a house that's almost projecting into the water. <laughs> um, and um, I'm not sure if that's the case around the world. Um, so I think, I don't know about China, but I mean, I don't know about much about India either, but it seems like people tend to move a little bit further away from the, the seashore before they build. Um, and I don't know about Argentina and Brazil. Uh, big cities in Brazil and Argentina appear to be away from the sea, um, which is not the case in, in India, for instance. I don't know about China that much. Um, and so do, do you see sort of a cultural, huge cultural variation here in terms of how people think? I don't know about Southern Europe. I, mean, um, I traveled a bit there, but I don't I don't see people building right by the sea. You know, it's it's a block away from the sea, typically. You know, these are questions I ask myself all the time. <laughs> Australians, Australians also love to live right by the sea. And I pass by those houses on top of a cliff and I wonder, are they being covered by insurance if the cliff falls? Cliffs are meant to fall. <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm at all, same as you. I, I, I pass by and I, I, I wonder, I wonder uh, what, you know, did they have an engineering telling them, look, you know, you might only have 50 years of this house. Eventually you will be at the edge of this cliff and it will fall in the water. <laughs> So I, I actually I actually have very little, you know, as an ecologist, I really don't know what is the culture and, 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 and how much of a role uh, do insurance and even the government play at, at communicating to people that it's not a long-term strategy. It's fine if you want to build a house for your own lifetime, but if you're thinking of living that for generations, it's probably not the place to build a house. <laughs> I don't know if that's well communicated. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is a very interesting research question, Anna. So culture, government policies, insurance, all sort of interact on this human behavior. And I was, I was thinking about, you know, Japan. Uh, I, I wonder what the situation there is. So, you know, that would be an interesting case study in itself. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, yes, I've, I always wonder because I love the view. I, you know, I, I would love the idea of living inside the house. It's amazing. But yes, um, it's an interesting, I guess, gamble that people... people interesting do. gamble, yes. <laughs> uh, so, so I want to go to another paper that you have more recently. Um, Below ground ecosystem engineers enhance biodiversity and function in a polluted ecosystem. So you said many important ecosystem functions are underpinned by below ground biodiversity and processes. Marine sediments, one of the most abundant habitats on Earth, are essential to the mineralization of organic matter. However, they are increasingly polluted by urban activities leading to the loss of biodiversity and the functions they provide. So we talked a bit about this. And so this is this is that non-linear effect again, right? I mean, we can really see how things sort of going to come together in 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, because there's so many things going on, right? Which we don't really have a good idea about, it seems. Yes. Um, yes, and, and I think this is aggravated by the fact that there are some habitats that we even, ecologies, we have been... Um, if you want, kind of even have forgotten. And there are a series of articles uh, 
that spanned a few decades, talking about how much we've forgotten um, marine sediment biodiversity and, and the importance that they have in ecosystems. So when we talk about habitat restoration, usually we talk about the spe habitat forming species, the oysters and the so much that I was talking about before. But we forget the sediments themselves are a very important habitat. Um, and I think it's interesting because for, I guess, uh, a lay person, uh, sediments seem to be lifeless and, and I don't blame them for that. It, you know, it, it took me a while as well to get, uh, to, get to appreciate them uh, myself, uh, even knowing what, what's the biodiversity in them. In there. But as ecologists, we should know better. <laughs> um, and, and still, for some reason, we kind of never doubt um, that it is better to have any kind of habitat, hard, what we call hard substrate habitat. And that is, uh, that could be an artificial reef, or it could be, um, or it could be an oyster reef, a uh, rock, a rocky, a rocky reef. Um, rocky outcrop it could be we we basically kind of by default go to the fact that any of those habitats would be better than just having sediment um but there's there's two sides of the coin here sediments are in great abundance so you know if we lose maybe what 100 meters squares shouldn't make a difference on the same time sediments are not all the same and they're not they're not all amorphous there's a lot of different types of sediments and sediments is very variable and some sediments are a lot more functional and provide a lot more services to humans than other types of sediments um so in, in one of the of the things for that paper is to try to put some empirical data into yeah. into what we have been trying to put out there <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, you know, one thing that caught my eye is you say all animals survive and introduce the polluted sediments and showed no evidence of sublethal effects. You say worms oxygenated sediments that um, reduced organic matter content by about 50% in situ. Um, so worms, um, you know, it's a big part of the system, isn't it? Absolutely. So I think that we have to think of um, sediments of these that the, there's a big part of big part of the biodiversity in sediments what they do these animals is basically it's like earthworms in a in a in a in, a, in your um, garden they mix the soil and they irrigate the soil and they're very important for the growth of the plants and these sea worms are not different to that um and i think that a, a point that i want to make there the interesting bit is that we have been better, we have improved in terms of the contaminations that we put out, right? Like middle, mid uh, 20th century, we were dumping a lot of industrial waste and raw sewage into our aquatic systems. We, we moved on from that, at least a lot of part of the world, of the world has. Um, and we are not doing that at the moment. So we have reduced the amount of um, contaminants that we put in um, overall. But what has been happening, um, even if we have done that, there's something that we call legacy contamination. Some of these materials we put up, they're not easy to degrade and they're still there. They're still in the sediments 50, 60, 80 years after they have been dumped. They'll be there forever. They'll be there they, forever. <laughs> they, yes, exactly so. So especially because um, the biodiversity being lost, those sediments be highly anoxic. That doesn't help to the degradation of those of those contaminants. So this is a, it's a negative loop that is happening yeah. there. You put in the contaminants, you lose the biodiversity. At the same time, when you lose the biodiversity, by the way, which is macro and micro, we're talking about bacterial biodiversity as well. When yeah. you lose that, then you end up with even less capacity of the system to process those contaminants, and it just comes becomes this negative feedback. Um, and so the idea in terms of in the context of nature-based solutions is what happens if we try to put it back some of the, that biodiversity? Because since we actually reduce the amount of contaminants that we're putting in the system, water quality is actually not that bad anymore. 
sediment quality is pretty bad because that's where the contaminants are. But water quality is actually not that bad in a lot of these systems that we've recovered. So what if we try to put some of those species back? What happens there? Can we, can we gain some of that capacity for the system to recover? And that, and that is the great thing. It, it looks like we might, we might be, we might be onto something here. It's, there's a lot more research that needs to be done in this space still, but um, the early indications are very promising that yes, that we can, we can, we can kickstart the recovery at least with the deployment of these worms. Yeah, I mean, so, so this idea of oxygenation is quite, quite important, right? So. The, the only thing I remember, Anna, from my civil engineering days 30, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, is, uh, is sewage treatment plants. We talk about basic oxygen demand, BOD. <laughs> so you need oxygen to, to break down things. Um, and so if, if, if we are sort of pushing the system to have less and less uh, oxygen, then as you say, it's sort of a vicious circle, right? I mean, you have more toxic stuff in there, you can break it down and you continue to build up bad and bad stuff over time. And so I suppose there is some sort of a break point in the sequence where you say, if you go beyond that, you know, you can't really come back because you, you, you're basically going to be in a situation that it's, it's impossible to come back. Absolutely, and, it, and, and it's highly arguable, uh, it's highly argued, but um, most of our things were already, were already past that point of return. We can do some, we can recover some of what we lost, but it would be very hard to go back to what, what we used to have. And that is something that, you know, there is a big debate about what ecological restoration means and what, are, what is the target of that. When we want to restore natural habitats, are we seeking to go back to what, early 20th century, 19th century state? Is that even feasible? Probably. Probably not um, yeah. in a lot of cases. So I think in most cases, um, I would argue we're already at that point of no return. We can improve to some extent, but I don't think we can go back to the way it used to be 200 years ago. Yes, yeah, you see in the paper, I guess the, the most important metric is biodiversity. So once we start to lose it, it gets to a critical point then we know things are going to be bad from there. So, so we can measure this, we can monitor it. We, I don't know if we have enough power to bring things back when things are really in you know, really bad shape. That part I don't know. Well, there, there's some species that have been lost, right? You cannot bring up background species that's completely lost. Yeah. Um, so what can happen is if you lost a species locally, but it's present around, you can bring it back to, from the surrounding areas. That, that is something that can happen, but you, you cannot really, you know, bring back to life. I mean, we might in the future, there, there is definitely development around that, that, that area. If we, if we have genetic material to do it, and that is a full on different discussion um, about how to do that. But it is, it is very interesting that at this point, for example, we don't use the word pristine environments. Um, mm. So for example, if I want to compare my, my restored um, or my restored, usually in a lot of these uh, studies where we're trying to understand the impacts of something, we're trying to restore something, we compare it to control site, right? Control site that is supposed to be the unmodified site. But it's usually somewhere, if you're very lucky, it's a marine park around the area or somewhere that has very little human intervention. The truth is we have reached all, all corners of the world. Um, this idea that even the, 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 the activities in one part affect, you know, everywhere. We have reached every corner. So we in the scientific literature, at least in ecology, we don't use the word pristine. We don't, we, you know, when we, we find a control, we would never say we're comparing to a pristine environment because we don't believe anything is pristine anymore. <laughs> um, which is a very sad, 
it's a very sad idea, but um, unfortunately, I do think it's correct. Yeah, so I want to finish up with your uh, the latest paper, linking habitat interactions and biodiversity with seas within seascapes. Um, so we already talked about this, but um, you talk about oyster reefs here, and Australia. We used to think Australia is pristine, Anna. <laughs> Not anymore. So, um, so, 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 what's what's oyster reefs again? Where are you finding this data? So, oyster reefs. You can think about them uh, like it's a tempered version of a of a coral reef, if you want, because those are are generations and generations of oysters that have grown on top of each other, and basically have formed this core um, of oyster shell, which are the shell of the old generations, and kind of the the top and the top veneer on top of it is a live oyster like the current generation if you want so it, it is a reef it is a hard structure that pops out from the bottom of the ocean but it's all built 100 percent by oysters and so um in the in the status quo uh, you say sediments close to oyster reefs had consistently greater amounts of uh, 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 organic matter, which in turn was possibly related to a number of taxa and a total abundance of informal communities. So, so, so you can study these things and you can sort of measure toxicity in there, just like coral leaves in some ways. Um, yes, yes. So I guess that the, the background for this is that um, Australia, and it's, it's interesting you say you thought it was pristine um, because Australia has a very interesting natural history. Um, early European colonizers have, when they arrived here, there was no, no good wood to build houses. So they started using oyster shell to produce mortar. So they used this local sandstone plus the oyster shell for lime and mortar to, to bind it all together, basically. Yeah. And what they did by doing that is very early in their first hundred years of colonization, uh, thought got rid of a huge amount of oyster reefs. Um, they dredged them out completely. Um, so we basically, Australia lost um, over 90% of the oyster reefs are gone. And they're mm. gone and they have been gone for so long um, and there is an interesting paper about this uh, from University of Adelaide. Um, they basically they have been erased from human memory. <clears throat> generations they haven't been seen around for generations. So it's only now, even though in the U.S. Um, oyster reef has been um, something that has been uh, restoring development for a while. Here in Australia, it's only in the last maybe twenty years um, or so that we have been really paying attention to that problem. And one of the interesting things when I when I when I, when I got in and I kind of started approaching that <clears throat> that scenario and coming from from this um, sediment perspective is um, we know the oysters produce a lot of feces and pseudofeces. Um, they just got rid of those and those deposited the sediments around them. Um, and that adds a lot of organic matter to the sediments. And we do know that that um, affects the function of those sediments, accelerates the processing of a lot of the, that organic matter. Um, but we don't understand if whether they can play a role in detoxifying, like you say, if in right. remediating some of the contaminants that potentially uh, can calm down um, from from human activities that access contamination and even fertilizers as well. There's a lot of um, um, nutrient contamination uh, through through the use of fertilizers in in agricultural areas, particularly. So, um, and that is a very interesting point. The, the 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 issue with that, I would say, and that's something that is a question that I have been trying to address. You know, the idea of putting bike oysters in very contaminated areas and see what role they play in there um, has been a bit difficult to do because oyster reefs occupy a big space. They're sharp, they're a boating hazard. So if I want to go and put an oyster reef in the middle of an urbanized area, 
it usually is not well received. So it has been a big challenge in, um, for uh, people here in Australia. It's that is um, uh, the, the main um, group doing oyster restoration here is the Nature Conservancy with which we are collaborating. Has been a bit challenging for them to choose the right spots um, in terms of you know you have to not only find the right spot ecologically for it, but also socially and culturally and um, from policy management, where can you put it out? Um, so I guess um, so. What I the, the idea of this paper was okay. We have some remnant oyster reefs around the area. Some of them are in, in, a, in a more sandy sediment. It's kind of usually a sediment that is very oxygenated and devoid of organic matter. Some of them are in more a muddy environment. Um, so can we compare how the oysters affect the sediments in those different environments um, and see um, to try to kind of predict what would have happened or have an idea of what would happen if we were to introduce those oysters in a highly polluted sediment. Um, unfortunately, we, we, we cannot do it at this point. I'm mean, still trying, I haven't lost faith. <laughs> we'll get there someday. Yeah, I mean, I don't know anything about this, Anna, but um, I'm wondering, there could be some applications of machine learning. Um, we know a lot more about chemistry now. And so, you know, ultimately it's about oxygenation, right? Oxygen gets rid of bad stuff. <laughs> If we, if we can pump oxygen into these these uh, bad situations, and um, this is fundamentally calcium, isn't it? You know the uh, the oyster reefs. I mean, it's a dip, deposit of calcium, isn't it? Yes, it's carbonate calcium, um, and there is research around the fact whether they whether they can. Where they can store carbon dioxide, where whether that could be a source of carbon dioxide storage. Um, the jury's out still on that. Some uh, it seems to be very variable in space. Um, whether they are uh, carbon positive or carbon negative it seems to be a bit dependent. It's not they're not um, you know, the the first hope of everyone is oh they have they have you know carbon and calcium for sure they should be and they get that out of the water so they should for sure they should be sequestrating some co2 but that, unfortunately that's not always the case it's a mm. bit um dependent um but in terms of oxygenation it's a very good point um the oysters themselves do not necessarily would not necessarily allow for the oxygenation of those sediments in fact they can do the opposite by adding more organic matter to those sediments mm. and potentially have a lot um they can even reduce oxygenation even more. Uh, you talked about, uh, I don't know how you call it, I forgot how you call that oxygen demand, we we'll call it sediment oxygen demand. Uh, we have a similar measure to the one you were talking before. Um, and they basically will increase sediment oxygen demand by adding extra organic matter in some cases. So I think that's where there's a very interesting interaction that we can, or, or, or kind of core planting that we can think of where we, put out oyster shells or oyster reefs and biotubators together. If we can do those two, then oysters will be cleaning the water. They're virtually just kidneys in the water. They filter the water out. They deposit a lot of that material in the sediments around them that biotubators and all the sediment biodiversity can help process. Um, that would be a very nice closing the loop system. And that's what I mean by the idea of thinking of a seascape approach to restoration, not just restoring one. And that is that is an idea that has been around um, for a bit. It's getting more traction now. Uh, this idea of not just targeting one habitat, but this idea that habitats interact with each other. And that interaction is very important for the health of that habitat itself, but also for the health of the entire, entire ecosystem. That is a movement that I think is really starting and taking, taking um taking shape now. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, Australia and New Zealand um, have always been sort of on the, on the front lines of um, thinking about these types of issues. So you're in the right place, I think, uh, Anna, to, to, to make an impact. Uh, I love Australia and New Zealand, except your cricket teams, but um, <laughs> other than that, you guys are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the US is, is doing great things. There's, there's great amount of projects in terms of, of habitat restoration, and there has been huge oyster reef restoration projects around the place. Um, it's, uh, 
there, there's a there's there's a lot of happening. Um, I do think it's more likely to happen in places that have space because all these restoration projects require space. Um, and if you have a very very short shoreline, and by that I mean you have you change, you know, you you have a seawall and straight up you have ten meters depth and you know very dredged, etc. That doesn't really allow for much. Um, so yeah. it's not something that, that can be applied everywhere, um, but uh, when it can be applied, um, if if it's possible, I think that's it. That's the only way we'll get very rich, long-term, sustainable results without a lot of investment because these things require initial investment, but then they're self-sustainable. Right. Yeah, no, not the case yeah, that you <laughs> No, no. So, so I was just wondering, you know, very quickly, uh, I think we're running out of time here, but I mean, Australia has a lot of expertise in this area. Uh, I, I would contend probably more expertise than any other country. So I wondered if there is, you know, some sort of, maybe it is led by University of Sydney, I, I don't know, uh, some sort of a, a systematic approach to this, because we are, we are always, you know, sort of playing on the margin, I would say, you know, I'll call them band-aid policies, <laughs> you know, localized interventions. But we have a very big problem that we have to solve. So, so I wondered if there is some sort of a global um, consortium who can come together to do this. Um, scientists or policymakers? Scientists, so, yeah. Scientists. yeah. Um, I mean, beyond our professional organizations, um, I don't think there's much happening globally. Um, we do have collaborations, you know, like the scientist to scientist kind of more personal collaborations happening. Um, I just sometimes feel like Australia is a small country. It has a small amount of people. We have a limited amount of universities and research universities particularly. Um, we are a small crowd. And I think that we do tend to collaborate abroad a lot. Um, if there is a bigger tendency maybe for Australian scientists to collaborate abroad maybe than other countries. And I wonder if maybe that's... Um, that is part of what of what you see um, as you know being and um, we're trying to think global usually uh, solutions at, at a global scale. Um, I I haven't worked professionally in, in academia anywhere else, so I I cannot say how different it is or not in the U.S. But here I I do I do feel that we push we try to get solutions that have global applications. And that is that is definitely a big focus, at least at least in the in the longer term, right? Even though we do for sure do local experiments. Um, always right. in mind is how can we apply um, these in other settings around the world. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Anna. Thanks so much for spending time with me. No, thank you very much. Thank you for for, for inviting me. Absolutely. Thank you.